Welcome to the Thinking Practitioner Podcast. A podcast where we dig into the fascinating issues, conditions, and quandaries in the massage and manual therapy world today. I'm Whitney Lowe. And I'm Till Luca. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Thinking, Thinking Practitioner. Practitioner. The Thinking Practitioner Podcast is supported by ABMP Associated Bodywork and Massage Professionals. ABMP membership gives professional practitioners like you a package including individual liability insurance, free continuing education, and quick reference apps, online scheduling, and payments with PocketSuite, and much more. ABMP CE courses, podcasts, and massage and bodywork magazine always feature expert voices and new perspectives in the profession, including Whitney Lowe and myself, Till Luca. Thinking practitioner listeners can save on joining ABMP at abmp.com slash thinking. Are you ready to take your skills to another level? Come check us out at advanced-trainings.com. Whether you've been practicing for decades or are just starting out, Advanced Trainings offers a wide range of online and in-person programs designed to boost your effectiveness, deepen your understanding, and inspire your professional creativity. With innovative self-paced programs, ranging from one-hour certificate courses on the most common client complaints, to our comprehensive CAMT certification program, we offer practice-changing learning events with industry-leading instructors and a supportive learning community that will take your work to another level. Plus, for a limited time, Thinking Practitioner listeners like you can enjoy a special offer. Sign up today at advanced-trainings.com and get a free month of our amazing AT subscription. Explore extensive library of courses, cancel anytime, and keep your credits all from just $20 a month with the first month free for TTP listeners like you. Enter a Thinking Subscriber at checkout for this limited time offer at advanced-trainings.com. Thank you. Dr. Peter Levine, it's a pleasure to have you here on the Thinking Practitioner podcast. You are the developer. I'll introduce you a little bit and then we'll okay. talk some. You're the developer of somatic experiencing. You almost need no introduction in our field because you've had such a big impact on our understanding of the nervous system and the body and how we pace and think about our work and even the, the therapeutic and beneficial effects of our work. Your bio describes you as being a naturalistic or the somatic experiencing other being a naturalistic and neurobiological approach to healing trauma with practitioners in over 40 countries. You hold doctorates in both biophysics and psychology. You are the founder of an advisor to the Somatic Experiencing Institute, the founder and president of the Ergos Institute of Somatic Education. You are the author of several best-selling books on trauma, including Waking the Tiger, which is published in over... 30 languages and was revolutionary when it came in because right. we only had Judith Thurman, Judith, Judith yeah, Thurman's book. That's right. That's what we all had to study as part of our training. And Made then it. all of a sudden we had you opening our eyes and bringing so much more dimension to it. And then your most recent book, uh, what's the title of that? I don't see that here. A, a, an Autobiography of Trauma, A Healing Journey. A autobiography of Trauma, A Healing Journey. Yes. I first met you at the Esalen Institute. Uh, it's probably, I had to think back on it, it's probably 1984. I was climbing down off the roof of the Rolf room where Ida Rolf was named in honor of Ida Rolf. Right. And you were teaching a workshop in there. And I, uh, I interrupted your workshop because I was actually sleeping outdoors under the stars in, in my Absolutely. job there and enjoying this beautiful view. And one morning I slept late and your workshop had started. So I climbed down off the roof. I remember that. That's how I first met you. <laughs> and then later, <laughs> later I got to study with you some there. And you came and very kindly taught uh, in a program I was coordinating at the Rolf Institute. And you taught part of our therapeutic relationship training. Yeah, yeah. This would have been the early 90s by That's now. That's right. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Them As were said, the days. Them were the days. Those were the days. Yeah. Uh, I put on Facebook that I was going to, have the opportunity to talk to you and ask you some questions and sure. said anything you want to know from Peter Levine. This is an amazing opportunity. And we got a lot of great questions, a lot of great ideas. Yeah. And I'll go ahead and put the link in the show notes. But I have really just two main questions for you today and, and a few variations. Really, how would us as body workers, as hands-on practitioners, yeah. be likely to recognize trauma and how yeah. And we, in our that capacity, be most helpful. Okay. Uh, you know, 
when I started developing the precursors of, of somatic experiencing in the uh, late 60s, um, I, I was, no, I was fortunate enough to not know because uh, trauma as PTSD wasn't really in the literature and for another 12, 13 years. And so I fortunately didn't know that trauma was supposedly an incurable brain disorder that could be at least best managed by medications and by helping people change their negative thoughts, their negative beliefs. And so in that was the common it, view at that point. That was the common view exactly. Well, and you, yeah, right, especially into when the when the the definition of trauma as PTSD occurred in the early 1980s. So um so anyhow, as a person uh, who is trained in a way to read bodies and that I owe dearly to um, uh, Ida Rolf because I studied her, with her in 1969 was really a very important part of my learning, of my education. Uh, so what happens when we're frightened or feel overwhelmed or we go outside and we see somebody has been injured or somebody's fallen off a roof and we go, we don't let the, we don't exhale, right? We don't go, we go inhale and we get stuck there. If we're bracing against being hit, say by a caregiver, a parent, and that becomes chronic, then we start protecting ourselves like this. Uh, when we see injury, our, our guts go, yuck. Actually, Darwin, in his book, The, uh, the Emotions in, in Man and Animals, uh, first uh, wrote about that nerve in the 1860s, and he called it the, what did he call it? The pneumogastric nerve, because it connects with the guts and connects with the lungs. That now nerve, better known as the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve. And he was, uh, by the way, interject anytime you want. I always enjoy more of a dialogue kind of thing. All right, great. And yeah. So anyhow, this nerve, which I think he actually realized, I, I've been trying to take some time to go over that book again to see if I can find this particular piece of information. But in any case, that nerve is the largest nerve in the body. And it goes from the back of the brain, the brain stem down through the diaphragm and connects to all of the visceral organs and also to the heart and the lungs. And um, that, that nerve, and this is something that has not been known really even today by many people, is that 80% of those fibers are afferent. In other words, they're going from the guts back up to the brain. Taking information so, up to the brain. Exactly, feeding them, yeah. And so if something happens and we go, ugh. So that that signal gets registered as injury in the brainstem, then it goes down into the organs, but then it gets sent back from the guts back to the brain where it becomes amplified. So we first start with, ugh, and then it gets amplified to, ugh. And then after a period of time, it becomes uh, it becomes fixed as the symptoms say, for example, of uh, irritable bowel, which is again very common for people who have had trauma histories. So the key is to break these feedback loops that I've just described, so that they're not continuing to send messages back to the brain that says that the threat is not over. So this to get a new signal from the guts. And so a lot of my work initially was to find out what does it take to change that feedback loop from a, uh, a positive feedback loop with negative consequences to set to uh, sending back the all clear signal. So again, that was the beginning of my, my understanding of also around that time, I studied animal behavior, animals behavior in the wild or wild animals and their natural environment and see how they shook off uh, uh, encounters with stress. And indeed, that the great majority, when they, because met, most prey animals might be predated, predated, you know, many times in a day, yet the observations 
that I made or using other people's observations is that it doesn't actually, um, they don't have the same kind of trauma symptoms that we do, or they wouldn't survive, or the species wouldn't survive. So that brought information to me. Another thing actually that was important in developing my work, I had the opportunity to uh, to uh, work with NASA, uh, developing ways to measure stress of the astronauts as they took off and then went into zero, zero gravity. And because most of the, the uh, astronauts did very well, they were resilient. But some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, astronauts would actually start throwing up when they went into zero g, and this is not just unpleasant; it could cause a, a critical malfunction in the in the electronics. So they really wanted to know initially uh, what's the first signal that you get that something like that could be happening. So again, I applied that to also to my clients that it was developing at the time so that they also could have that resilience that bouncing back that clearly we saw in the astronauts and in the wild animals so that's that's really clear it's the signal it's this feedback loop you said the signal from the brain to the body that escalates into a feeling of things are just not okay I can imagine if you're floating around in space, your guts are giving all kinds of strange signals and your brain's getting mm -hmm. all kinds of di uh, different activities. But even in our clients, uh, we are in many ways telling the body that things are okay with our hands, with our voice, with the environment. That's right, exactly. With our hands, with our voice, with meeting their rhythm, with our rhythm, you know, connecting yeah. human to human, mammal to mammal <laughs> and we're, we're going a little out of order here because one of my questions was uh what's the difference between healed and unhealed trauma yeah well you, you know a clue yeah. there i think yeah i think un unhealed uh, untreated and unhealed trauma uh has a profound effect on our health not just on our mental health but on our physical health and to, a, I mean, to a large, large degree. Uh, and trauma that's been healed, that's been transformed, on the contrary, also very, it leaves people very often in high degrees of empathy and care and sensitivity. You know, as it's kind of in a way ironic because when it's unhealed, it's a completely destructive force. When it's healed, it's a completely constructive force. You know, there's a, a, a saying in the, uh, uh, the Gnostic go Gospels. If you bring forth that which is within you, that which is within you will be your salvation. If you do not bring forth that which is within you, then that which is within you will be your destruction. And I think that really applies to trauma. And to the need, I mean, you don't have to look very far. I mean, just turn, you know, who will lose on it? And you see this prevalence of violence almost in every direction. And and that kind of violence very frequently leads to violence years later. The question is, is a traumatic event itself the trauma or is it the way we recover from trauma or not, is that the injury? It's not in the event. It's in the body. It's in the nervous system. It's definitely not. Yeah. And, and the bouncing back idea, I think, is in there. Yeah, the resilience. Yeah. yeah the resilience is is, is critical. Um, actually, that my doctoral dissertation was uh, basically was on resilience. I didn't, it wasn't called resilience at that time. But can we help our clients who have been traumatized to restore that resilience, to um, to come back with more uh, compa compassion to self and others? I mean, these are the things that um, are the 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 positive side of trauma. But only trauma that turns out, because if it's not, you know, uh, it as I say, it leads to all kinds of physical problems, physical and emotional problems. 
And it also leads to, I mean, you see this kind of thing where these wars go on every 15, 20 years, because when the the children, you know, who had trauma uh, become then adults, of course, many will suffer physical uh, problems, but many will also be uh, victims of their own violence and violence towards others. So I think it's the most being uh, under, misunderstood, belittled form of suffering in the human condition. And again, ironically, that is also one of the most powerful catalysts for opening to, uh, in some cases, spiritual dimensions. Has the potential to really open us up and add meaning. To open us up or to shut us down. Yeah. Okay, so what what are, if we can get really practical, what would you, what advice would you give to body workers about signs uh, or situations where they want to put on their trauma lens, say, or their trauma sensitivity? Is that a fair question? Yeah. It is. It's not necessarily trivial to answer. Yeah. But, you know, the body is a snapshot of what has happened to us in the past. That was actually one of the things that Ida Rolf really thought. And, uh, but it's a snapshot of responses that got stuck. So going back to that first example. So if we were hit, for example, as a child, our shoulders start to go up and protect themselves. They'll stay there until they get a message that it's okay to let down. Now, one of the things I think is important, especially important for golfers, is that sometimes we, um, we maybe push on the muscles and maybe push on the muscles too hard because the body needs to know that it's safe, that it's safe again. So that's really, essential to really be gentle, to take time to let the body speak to you. So I just had a class, with a uh, postgraduate class with my students. And, you know, and a number of them were body workers, and but a number of them were psychotherapists. And I had them both just put their hands on the person's shoulders and just sit there and wait. And that's one thing that we often are impatient we don't we're, we don't wait. We want to go in and change that tension, that mu those muscle tension. But that doesn't work because if it's too hard, it responds as it responded in the past by bracing. So we have to really come in in a much more mindful, delicate way rather than really trying to get into the muscles and making the muscles uh, relax, uh, let go. Oh, you were describing a trauma response of the shoulders going up, and you said we could just, think, you know, as a, maybe if I'm just thinking uh, physical level, maybe I'm going to push the shoulders down. To talk to the shoulders with your touch to say, here I am, I'm with you, Yes. and I'm just going to stay here and support you so that you can let go. That's yes. the type of message we want to convey in our hands to the other person's bodies. You were creating waves at the Rolf Institute when I was uh, first teaching there. Yeah, yeah. With your with these ideas, they were not mm -hmm. such radical ideas, but they're they're fundamental. And they were saying you were questioning our explanations. And I remember at some point, um, it, it, tell me if this is a false attribution, but someone said uh, uh, Peter Levine has some calculations that show that the force we use couldn't possibly change fashion the way we think we are. And that the changes must be due to something else. Yeah. And this started a number of us on an inquiry, including Robert right. Schleit, my mentor there, on yeah, this yeah, big yeah. fascial inquiry. Right. Actually, uh, you know, I'm just thinking in the last few years, I think that Ida Roth was largely correct okay. about the fashion. Oh. But again, the question is how to approach the body, including the fascia. And... Um, because uh, it's not, I think this is uh, also Ida's, Dr. Rolf's uh, theory as well. So when we've been protecting ourselves for a long period of time, it would be very non-conductive for the economy of the body to keep the shoulders up and to use neuromuscular energy to do that. So 
uh, arguably what the fascia does is it said it shortens itself. And so when it's, when it's uh, shortening, then it's going to lead to be, need to be also lengthened again. But again, the question is how and when, you know. So I would say as a general rule, when the body go of some of the holding, some of the, the nervous system holding, then also we can do a little bit starting much more gently, of course, and then just start stretching some of the fascia out so the body can return to where it's supposed to be. When you say that you're thinking now she was correct in ways that maybe you weren't thinking before, is that what you're talking about? That there is a role for the physical part of the body in reinforcing these shapes yeah. and patterns? Yes, indeed, and the, and the fascia itself. The but fascia we, have itself. To, we, have to, we have to also be aware of the body's response, the nervous system response, the, neuro, yes. the neuromuscular response. That's right. You came in, again, when I was there in the 90s, you were coming in and doing in-services with us, both in my class, but also with us as a faculty. Right. Uh, how, how did you get involved with the Rolf Institute, and where did that fit in your own development uh, and interesting, professional interesting. life? You know, uh, I started, as I said, I was really still very much bonded, uh, attached with um, Ida Rolf. I, I was one of the people she allowed to call her grandma. <laughs> And, you know, I presented some of my work and she said, Peter, you have it, but not all of it. But she, to her credit, she allowed some of my understanding of the nervous system, of how trauma gets large in the body to be part of the education. So a number of the people who were there at the time, I remember Peter Melchior, um, yeah. uh, uh, Michael Salveson, yeah. uh, I think, uh, no, I don't remember who all the people that were there, uh, Bill Smythe. Yes. And, yes. you know, and, and they really incorporated both. And it's kind of interesting because I was just talking to Bill just about 40 minutes ago. We keep in contact from time to time. And, you know, he's, his hands are the hands that I like to be in. Yeah. You know, because he really, he knows about presence. Uh, Peter Melchior knows about presence, knows about presence and connection and how absolutely crucial that is in a, in being gifted practitioners. Did you work as a rolfer? Did you actually do the 10 series and do that? I process? did. I did. I did. I did. But, you know, at the same time, of course, I was developing my, my other work. You know, I just completed... I, like you mentioned, in my uh, last book, I don't know, last book, my most recent book, it's called nice An book. Autobiography of Trauma, A Healing Journey. So it's about my healing. And one of the chapters, one of the sections are the four most important women in my life. And um, Ida Roth, of course, was one of them. That's great. Fascinating. And really, really any of the others deserve mention here? I'm sure I'm glad to. Well, the first person that really uh, <laughs> woke me up was a woman named Charlotte Selvers. Oh, of course. Yeah. I studied with her. I was blessed to be able to study with her for a couple of years at Esalen. Oh, okay. Well, that's wonderful because she and her husband, Charles. Um, Those books. Yep, yeah, yeah, Charlotte books. Uh, when what, I came to do a workshop with the Zen monks, I mean, quite frankly, I didn't know I had a body. And during that time, uh, she would have us do the, the most stupid things, like putting a stone in her hand and walking around and feeling the, te the weight of the stone, the texture of the stone, the feeling of the hand holding this. I mean, it's just driving me crazy. I remember walking. That's the whole curriculum right there. That's what you just described. That would be a day. Yeah, that's right. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And um, one time my my eyes caught one of the Zen monk's eyes and I said, how is this for you? And he said, big headache. <laughs> but after that, I think it was the second day, uh, it was sunset and I walked out from the church. 
on the top of O'Farrell Street. And I looked across at the lights of the San Francisco of the city. And it was the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. So I realized something had happened. Mm -hmm. And so that really helped me. She really elegantly stood for the richness of experience itself. It, yes, indeed, without interpretation. Yeah, without without interpretation. interpretation. That's right. And that, so that was an important influence. And then uh, after that, I worked with a woman, most people don't know of her, um, uh, Magda Proskauer. And she was a, a, a physiotherapist, but also trained as a Jungian analyst. And I worked with her for at least a year, maybe a year and a half, two years. And again, it was also an awakening. Then my next teacher was Dr. Rolf. And uh, she taught me to see things as they are. Actually, I have some two beautiful pictures of Dr. Rolf in the autobiography. And I look at those pictures now with fondness and with with fondness and appreciation. Uh, also, one of the photographs is of her working with a baby, with an infant. And she encouraged me to work with, with babies and, and children, which I did. And actually, I learned a lot working with children. A lot about, you know, how our bodies hold and how our bodies can re can. Release. And perhaps how to pace the work because kids won't stand for it if it's not right. <laughs> right. Yeah, good. Yeah, how to pace the work, how to really uh, be in contact because if you're not in contact with a child, they know that immediately. Yeah. They're not going to get anywhere. So you absolutely have to be present with them. And yeah. uh, over the years, I've worked with many, many children and have a great debt of gratitude to uh, to Dr. Rolf. The fourth woman, fourth woman. We, is the fourth, because there were four, was a woman named Mira Rothenberg. And she wrote a book, which I, I republished, called Children with Emerald Eyes. I talk about it in my book. And uh, she had a way of connecting with children at the core level of where they were stuck. And he was seriously disturbed kids and autistic kids. And she really taught me to trust my guts when I'm with a person, as she did with her. Yeah, and I mentioned just a couple of her cases. Uh, one was a, a child named Peter, my namesake. And the other was about a boy who he was the youngest uh, child at the time to, to survive being in an incubator. And uh, he was completely shriveled. And she said, by all means, uh, he was, what did she say? I think she said kind of bluntly, he was ugly. And she connected with this child. And I was working with my students at the time. And these were mostly psychotherapists. And I talked about how important it is for our later development, for what has happened to us in the very earliest parts of our, our life, which would be in utero and around around birth. And though so, and then one of my students brought in this book by hers, doing when they were alive. And I immediately found out how to contact her. Now, remember, it was not easy to contact people like you do today. You go on, you know, you go online. And, so I don't know, somehow I found her and we connected and we've been together. She she died a few years ago, sadly. But whenever I would be coming back from Europe, I would stop in New York and I would spend some some days with uh, Mira in her house in, in Brooklyn in Snopes Hill. And she became one of my dearest, dearest friends. She was tough. You don't mess with her. But she knew where kids were, where they were hiding, and she knew how to coax them out from those citadels. So those are the four women who have made it a vitally important influence on my, on my life, on my work and on my life. I see a 
a child in a picture and behind you there. Oh, okay. Okay. That's actually the very last page of my autobiography. That's a picture of me when I was about 18 months old. And that's in my that's kind of my return to that innocent child. Yeah. And and in preparing for my for my last days on earth to connect with him, to be with him. So thank you for noticing. Yes. Oh, what a what a poignant reminder there. Yeah. The bookends of our life. The mm -hmm. beginning and reconnecting. So we all hope to be able to do. Bookends. I like that one. I'm gonna use that if you're okay with it. <laughs> of course. The bookends of my life. It's really good. Back to the practicalities. How can we as body workers be most helpful when we have clients who may be dealing with unresolved trauma? Yeah, yeah. Um, first to connect. Yeah. And that means first to connect with ourselves and then connect with the other and spend time together. You know, uh, some years ago, I was talking to Bill, Bill Smythe, a very good friend, became a very good friend. And he said that when he sees a client, the first set, first or even second session, um, he doesn't have them lay down on the table. He really gets to meet them, to talk about what they want, what they need, if they have a sense of things that have happened to them in the past, which are holding them back. So he makes some connection on, on in that way. And I think that's in a way a good, good rule, you know, uh, not just looking at the structure, the body structure, but mm. looking at really the history as it's portrayed in the body structure. Mm. So taking time to get to know the person, it really takes it out of that subject object separation yeah, too. Right. And, and you know, as you just start working with the child, of working with a person that has been traumatized as a child, uh, it's very likely they're going to do what they've done, which is to defend themselves. So you want to kind of create the possibility of some degree of safety because trauma is about the opposite of safety. It's about threat, not about safety at all. And how to help how to help create it. And you know, and my teaching about that actually occurred when I was a child. And uh, my uh, my father was long story, uh, uh, was the object of the mafia. And the mafia w was threatening the life of my family. So we didn't have that sense of protection. And so, you know, a thing that I say is that trauma isn't what ha just what happens to us, but trauma is what happens to us in the absence of the present empathetic other. And that's, and, and I didn't have that that time. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why it led to such a great trauma and probably also in a way what led me on my path for understanding trauma and for helping people heal doing my own healing, but helping other people heal. You said trauma is what ab happens in the absence of the empathetic other. Other, yes. So it's a, 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 a per interpersonal context that I can rest into, that I can feel safe within. Without that, yeah. is there going to affect exactly, me? We it. And we can do that. You know, we can do that initially by being with the person, by being with the client, by contacting their bodies sometimes just uh, you know doing some body awareness you know well, what do you notice how, how what do you what do you notice in your shoulders so we're connecting with ourselves we're connecting with the person we're creating safety we're helping them connect with their own bodies that's right and find some degree of relative safety because there is no such thing as absolute safety that's why I... relative safety okay yeah. or safe enough safe enough to create safety not as a state, but as a possibility or a shift or a quality that could be present, even if other things are present too, maybe? Exactly. Exactly. That's great. Great list. Yeah. yeah. So again, as body workers, if, you know, again, another thing 
that uh, I think is important uh, is, you know, when we have a person laying on the table and we're standing above them, that actually triggers uh, signals of non-safety. Because again, we're programmed, you know, if there's something above us looming towards us, we, we're pr programmed to, to uh, respond to that as threat. You know, if you think about a bird of prey is coming from above, above down. So again, we want to find a way that we're not standing above the person when they're laying down so that we might be sitting first and then having them get, get on the table. So little things like this can actually make quite a difference. The physical modeling that we have, the ways that we're physically in relationship can create yeah. that yeah, possibility exactly. or that relationship exactly. quality. That's okay. right. That's right. Okay, so you work with body workers. As you mentioned, you work with a lot of psychotherapists. I have Correct. Uh, friends who are in both professions who count you amongst their key mentors. At what point might uh, body workers be out of their scope of practice uh, when working with trauma? Yeah, that's an important one. That's really important one. Um, you know, at least like there's not an absolute, um, you know, boundary, but there is a boundary. And when you're really, really delving into the, I really have such a difficult time saying this in the way I want to want to say it and convey it. Wow. But when we start probing and asking them more and more about their traumas. And I think that's the time when we may go over the boundary as a body worker. Because yeah. you can't say, well, we don't address their traumas because whenever somebody who's touching the body is addressing the trauma as it's large in the body. And I yeah. think we have to keep it in that level, in that dimension. But there's something in the probing or the map of where the boundary is when I'm reaching or pulling something or inviting something that is about the trauma that might be not body work at that point. That's right. But again, at the same time, when you're a, with a, another person with their body, you, um, you are working with the imprint of trauma as it is on the body. And I think that's the, that's the key. And that's where I'm, I'm, comfortable in in teaching both uh body workers and therapists but also to not just go over that that boundary or at least you know I, I, m many people who are body workers um you know after working with me have decided to get a uh a, like an mft or a lcsw degree or a psychologist yeah. degree uh, and also in the this is a kind of an interesting thing what i was starting to do uh, teach SE. One group of my students said they should only be taught to psychotherapists, to psychologists and psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I disagreed with that. I thought that was a mistake because not they're not the only ones that deal with trauma. And so I really convinced them at the time to be open to, uh, be open to what's going on in the here and now in the body. You know, that was another thing uh, with Ida Rolf, um, which I, I, I speak fondly of in the, my, in the autobiography. Uh, so that when we, she would demonstrate on her model. And so she would do the first hour and then, and she, people were, we were scared of her. People were scared of her. I wasn't so much scared of her. Uh, so, so we then, we there were I think there were two Rolfers in Big Sur at the time, Peter Melchior and, and Jan Sultan. So we would buy them beers at the Esalen Bar. In exchange, they would tell you know we would prod them and it, what does the second hour look like? So we were ready to say when she said, well, what should I do? We were ready to say. So we came in, and you know she, the model stood up and she said, what do you see? And so some of the people talked about not what they saw but what they heard from Peter and Jan. How did that go? Uh, well, I'll tell you how it went. Uh, poorly. I mean, she <laughs> became more and more impatient. 
and we were yeah. all getting kind of scared. Yes. You know, and we said, well, we need to work with the uh, internal malleolus and the relationship to the solid shoulders. Yeah. Um, and she said, no, what do you see? What is actually in front of you now? What's yeah. exactly in front of you? And that's one of the greatest gifts that I got from Dr. Rolf, and which I describe in the autobiography, is how do you see it without your filters, without your thoughts, to yes. really go to your inner knowing? That's right. And we do that with our clients, too. I mean, clients come in with their, they want to tell you their diagnoses, their histories, what people have told them about their body. Yeah. And there's yeah. Oh, such therapeutic value in just asking, what do you feel? How do, what's happening right now for you? Yeah, yeah, right. And how do you actually sense that? Oh. Okay, how do you know your shoulders are up high, your right shoulder is higher? How do you know that? How do you know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if someone wasn't telling you, how would you know? That's that's the yeah. fundamental question. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think I just owe you even more than I realized in my own professional path and my it, personal path as well, because everything you're speaking of here was such a key uh influence and formative piece that of course I I I I remember being quite disoriented by after studying with you at first and it's like what you were saying was a real big mismatch from what I'd been hearing and learning elsewhere anyway. and and at some point after about maybe a decade of chewing on that I, I didn't feel as as uh jangled by it and I realized yeah. now I probably just uh, assimilated it wholesale and now yeah. I think it's my my own. And I, I say those yeah. things too, but I probably very much got a lot of that from you and people like Charlotte Delver and the people around like Jan Sultan, Peter Melchior, Bill Smythe, yeah. that I studied with yeah. from the on as well. Now these are, um, you know, I think um, Ida Roth has left us with this legacy, this legacy to inform body workers and therapists to some degree in a way that um, we all are in debt. And again, as I described being in debt to the four women in my life, but I think Ida Rolf left in some ways one of the greatest legacies. She really did. Oh, I just want to work in a couple threads before we wrap it up. You've talked about the role that ritual and ceremony play in healing trauma and cultures that have the connections to shamanic practices. Right. Uh, can you say anything more about that? You know, one of the chapters is called Healing Through Shamanism and Science. Okay. But the study of shaman, shamanism is a, a, a science in a way. You know, um, People have said that my work was only something from me and, and not something that was transmissible. So I really needed to keep it in a way pragmatic, but uh, clearly uh, I value the contact that I've had over the decades with different shamans. And also, again, I write about that and particularly one man named Enrique it was a Brazilian, it, it, it called it Pai of the Sun, which means a father saint in the Umbanda religion. And uh, he clearly had perceptions that I didn't have, but he gifted me with those perceptions. So, and then I had the opportunity to, to spend some time with the Kranaki people in Northeast Brazil, in the jungles in Northeast Brazil. And I think what I learned from the from the chief there was how in the therapeutic model, we think, okay, we do therapy with a client. And yeah. their understanding is quite different. When I went to visit him, you know, he asked me why I'd come. And uh, I said I was interested in, in, in sustos, which is Portuguese and, Sp and Spanish for uh, uh, right paralysis. And he, he said, yes, he knew about that. He also knew about the word trauma. His his daughter, the princess, was the first person to go to school, to go to uh, college. And so he even knew the word trauma. 
but he really helped me understand that trauma doesn't occur in a vacuum and the healing doesn't occur in a vacuum. That is essential to also bring the community yeah. into the healing. Mm -hmm. So that was another important meeting of, of different kind of shamanistic understandings. Mm. Well, I'm thinking of our mutual friend, Maria Lucia. Oh, yeah. And six years ago. And uh, her work and her studies and her pre her spirit that she'd bring yeah. in. Yeah. You know. And there's, I mean, there's, there's something that catches in my ear when I hear it, and it's related to what we're talking about here. And that is that trauma is something that uh, is in the body or can be released from the body. And I get it, and I, it's a helpful way of thinking about it. These are my thoughts for a second, that there's something in our body that is trauma and that maybe it could be released. But then I start to go, wait a minute, is trauma a thing that can evaporate or be expelled, or is it a process or a, a reaction? It's a reaction for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's a reaction. Um, and... Uh, you know, I think I know that we have an innate drive to healing and wholeness. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced of that. And if we don't understand that, then we're pretty limited in what we can do. Well, so, um, so I think it's harnessing this drive that innate that's drive that's right. in, 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 in our healing, the healing of our clients. You know, and we're there for, as for support. You know, we're there uh, to, yeah, to support that. And that is a process. It's not something that you do and then you're done with it necessarily. It's a movement towards growth. Whitney, my co-host, he sent a question and he said, it seems like we're careening toward a world that's more enmeshed in all kinds of trauma. How do we as healthcare professionals take care of ourselves in the best way to help take care of others? Yeah, important, critically important how we take care of ourselves. You know, um, when I wasn't years ago seeing clients, uh, I have a place in uh, Lyons, Colorado. And at the end of the day, I would walk down to the river and put my feet in the river. And if it was a day where there was a lot of really horrendous trauma that I was helping deal with. Uh, I, ha I had a collection of cans and I would kick the cans down Apple Valley Road. And my neighbors would say, oh, that's Dr. Levine. He's had a rough day again. To just really, you know, express that, reconnect to my life energy. Wow. I think that's really, really the essence of it. And also, you know, to to have uh, uh, colleagues that we can talk to, and mm -hmm. um, and help each other. I think that's really also um, vitally important. Uh, you know, somebody we can call or just say, you know, <laughs> can we get together? At, let's maybe just have some dinner or some lunch or something like that. So we do have we enlist helpers for ourselves. You know, because of Chiron, the wounded healer, we all are wounded healers and we all need the support of others. You know, there's a Motown song. It takes one to stand in the dark alone. It takes two to let the light shine through. And this is something that I think we really need. And it's a gift that we can give to ourselves. And by being some more with ourselves, we'll be able to be more with our clients. You know, so-called burnout is a you know a, a, an important thing. It's gotten a lot of press, but what really is burnout about? I think burnout is a bit about not being able to take care of ourselves Man. in a fundamental way. So all of this stuff accumulates over time. Well, I I mentioned the Facebook thread where I asked, "What do you want me to ask, Doctor Levine?" And one of the things that came out there was just an enormous amount of appreciation for you and the impact you've had on the world and our profession in particular. And I just want to take a moment here at the end of our conversation to thank you personally, too, because I knew you were a big influence, but now in this conversation, too, I'm seeing all the ways that the, in the 40 years since I first met you, 
you have planted seeds that are I like seeds like Johnny Appleseed plant, planting seeds wherever <laughs> he went he went there thank you so much and you know and you can get information if you want for this uh, from our website uh, somaticexperiencing.com and it also links with the Somatic Experience International so if you want to find therapists or find where there are trainings I say anybody who does any kind of healing work should at least take the first three modules of the class because it's something that you'll be able to you carry with you for your own personal work and understanding, but for your on your clients. So I just leave you with that thought. So many great resources there. We'll put it in the show notes as well. And in your first book, uh, Waking the Tiger, your most recent book, An Autobiography of Trauma, we'll link to those as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay, anyhow, good reconnecting with you, Bill. And uh, yeah, I enjoy. I enjoyed the the back and forth. I so appreciate your time. Books of Discovery has been part of massage therapy education for over 20 years. Thousands of schools around the world teach with their textbooks, e-textbooks, and digital resources. Books of Discovery likes to say, learning adventures start here. You see that same spirit here on the Thinking Practitioner podcast. And they're proud to support our work, knowing we share the mission to bring the massage and bodywork community enlivening content that advances our profession. Check out their collection of e-textbooks and digital learning resources for pathology, kinesiology, anatomy, physiology at booksofdiscovery.com, where thinking practitioner listeners like you save 15% by entering thinking at checkout. Thanks, Books of Discovery. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Stop by our sites for the video of this conversation, the show notes, uh, transcripts, and extras. Whitney's site, academyofclinicalmassage.com. My site, advanced-trainings.com. If you have comments, questions, or things you'd like to hear us talk about, just record a short voice memo on your phone and email it to us at info at thethinkingpractitioner.com. We might even play it on the air. Or look for us on social media at our names, at Whitney Lowe or at Toluca. Rate us, please, on Apple Podcasts, as it really does help people find the show and helps uh, our sponsors know that their their support is worthwhile. You can find us on Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever else you listen. Please do share the word. Tell a friend. Thanks for listening.